Sonny Rollins, one of the truly legendary jazz men and tenor saxophone players of our time. Critics have ranked him alongside jazz giants like John Coltrane, Coleman Hawkins, and Lester Young since the 1950s. But Sonny Rollins solidified his reputation even earlier, playing with Miles Davis, Thelonious Monk, and Art Blakey. And by age 26, he'd earned recognition as a pioneer in his own right with the release of his seminal album, Saxophone Colossus, in 1956. Sonny Rollins was also at the forefront of the free jazz movement in the 1960s, inspired by Ornette Coleman. Through the 1970s, his live performances elevated jazz beyond the nightclub realm, proving it was also an art form worthy of the concert hall. There have been Grammy Awards and accolades for Sonny Rollins, including his induction into the Downbeat Jazz Hall of Fame, and recently the Jazz Journalists Association of America honored him as Musician of the Year as well as Tenor Saxophonist of the Year, and Roadshows Volume 1, a collection of live performances together on an album that came out last year as best historical recording. But perhaps one of his greatest accomplishments is that today, at 78 years old, you can still hear his verve, his tenacity, and his unrelenting ability to play like he has something to prove. He is a jazz icon and a true living legend, and it is a pleasure to welcome Sonny Rollins into Studio Q. Hello, sir. Well, okay, I didn't know I could follow that, but thank you very much, Jim. Well, it's, it's a wonderful. Great pleasure to have You're you here. Very, uh, honored by that introduction, certainly. Well, well, I mean, when an album or concert of yours is reviewed, it's often accompanied by phrases like uh, one of the last true jazz giants. How do you feel about billing like that? Well, um, I try not to read my reviews, so that, that keeps me you keep it real, safe, right? Keeping it real. I, w- I want to start with this with road shows. This this uh, this album came out last year. You're here in Toronto for the opening of the jazz festival you're playing tonight. Then you're on to Vancouver, Saskatoon, to Europe. Uh, it's clear that that you don't dislike playing. I wonder how uh, where touring fits into your life and how happy you are when you're playing. Well, I'm very happy when I uh, meet the people. And the and the performing experience is very exhilarating. It's what sort of uh, makes it the greatest experience in the world, really. And um, that beats everything. Now, traveling is a little difficult these days, as I'm sure you know. Most people know that travel. So that's it's a more little more restrictive. You mean in terms of where you can get getting around? Well. Uh, having to take off your shoes right. and you know, sure. and walking a long distance in the airports, this kind of stuff is a little bit um, problematical for me. Um, however, whatever I go through, once I finally get on the stage, it's beautiful for me, and I still have an audience who appreciates what I do. So. Mm-hmm. That's the uh, ultimate. I, I, you know, I really can't ask for anything more. I'm perfectly blessed, and I'm grateful for it. So I have really no complaints. Let's get it down to that. When you talk about the exhilaration of performing on stage, is there something musically less inhibited uh, about performing live or on a stage, say, than there will be in the studio? Definitely for me, yeah, because I get something back from the audience the audience gives me their hopes, feelings, hmm. and uh, so that's the mixture. And uh, you know, I give them my fears, my hopes, and so forth. Hmm. But uh, it comes together. And uh, I often said that um, one one performance on stage is worth maybe six months of practicing at home Wow! because you can learn things are so condensed that uh, they come together in such a way that, um, you know, it, it, it's really the, the perfect, it's, it's a perfect experience. Hmm. I know they say sex is a perfect experience, but... <laughs> but I, sax is better? <laughs> sax is better. There you go. I have to remember that, to use that. If you don't mind, can they use it? You've myself? got it. You've got okay. it. Okay. Yeah. But, it, but it, and, and uh, you'll forgive me for if, if this veers too spiritual, but when you talk about feeling the crowd... 
are you inspired then by the audience or are you channeling or indeed reflecting uh, what you feel from the audience? Well, I try not to actually pay attention to the audience, actually. I try to, you know, when I was a kid, I used to go to a place called the Apollo Theater in New York. And that was a very tough house on all the great acts that came in. And if a great performer didn't have it that night, the people in the audience would holler up at them, you know. (laughs) So I've learned that it's not about the audience, it's about the performer. Mm. So I don't expect anything from my audience. It's always on me to do it, you see. So that it's, uh, I really try not to pay any attention to the audience. But the fact that they're there, of course, the vibrations and so on. You Stokes know, it, you. Yeah. Uh, you talk about being a kid. Let's, let's go back, if you will, to the beginning for a moment. You, you grew up in the Sugar Hill District of Harlem in the 30s and 40s. Uh, this is a neighborhood famous for producing jazz musicians like Coleman Hawkins, Don Redman. What was it about that area at that time that produced so many jazz greats? Well, at that time, uh, Sugar Hill was sort of the elite part of Harlem, which was a black community in New York. And uh, all of the great uh, black uh, statesmen, politicians, um, artists lived there. Excuse me. So that... um, there was a great, uh, you know, like when I was a kid, I used to see um, on the block we lived on, uh, it was a great uh, black uh, uh, historian, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, mm-hmm. and he used to, I used to see him every day. There was a lot of other, and I remember W.E.B. Du Bois would look at us, you know, and we would be playing ball, and he'd sort of look at us in a stern way. He was sort of a very stern guy, you know, and he's like to say, oh, look at those little ruffians, you know, they should be home reading a book or something, you know. But uh, there were all sorts of great people in the black community that lived up on Sugar Hill. And then you talk about playing ball. Uh, If I have the story correct, your family was, you come from a really musical family. They were encouraging you to play piano and and get involved in music, but you wanted to play baseball. Right. I love stories like this. This is Sonny (laughs) Rollins, the guy we know as the legendary musician. Uh, What what was it about baseball that was attracting you more than music when you were a kid? Well... Uh, you know, I just liked, uh, I was sort of outdoor. I, I was sort of the uh, black sheep in the family, in a sense, because my older brother and sister, they were much more for, formal, form, uh, formal people, and they went to school and everything. And I was sort of the guy that was always out playing. And since I was the baby, my mother forgave me and I could do <laughs> a lot of things. So right. uh, that's why I didn't have to take piano, you know, whereas my brother and sister, they had to do violin and they had to do piano and all this stuff. But um, eventually when I began to uh, really get into jazz, then I, I, you know, really wanted to be a musician. I always loved jazz and I was into it from early age. But... Um, I finally realized that that was to be my life's work, Mm. you know. Well, when you're 13 years old, I I take it this is a turning point. Your mom buys you your first saxophone. And then, uh, and you very quickly become very well known. Uh, You you obviously had the the musical chops either in your genes or in in practicing from a a very early age Mm -hmm. because you become well known at at a young age. But But you don't... Uh, you're self-taught. You, you don't have any formal education at that point. Very right? and, little, yeah. And when Ornette Coleman was on this show, he he said he was self-taught, and he said that that actually helped him to learn to communicate an emotional intensity of playing, That and, and he was actually gratified or glad that he didn't have any formal training. Would, does that resonate for you? Um, yes and no. I always... Uh wish that I had had a had formal training and um that was so I I always felt that I had to go back and study in fact I took some sabbaticals during my lifetime 
to study more, you mm, know. Right. So uh, in a sense, uh, I understand on that point, and I think it's a very good point. Uh, but I think if you have a minor talent that he had, it's pro- he's going to do it anyway. I guess you he's know. saying creative freedom comes from not being not having structures imposed structures. on you by education. Exactly, exactly. That's that's a good point. It's a good point. You, I mean, certainly Louis Armstrong and Charlie Parker were at the forefront of jazz at the time you were a teen. And uh, now some jazz players were split in, in their allegiances, and to either of these players, who were you initially influenced more by? Who was your guy? Well, I liked. Uh Everybody, I like Louis Armstrong because I would see him in all of these Hollywood movies, and mm-hmm. once he come on the screen, he'd light up the screen with his performances. You know, he'd usually be singing and playing. You know, and that would so I, you know, of course with Louis Armstrong, and um, I also like Charlie Parker. Of course, when Charlie Parker came along, it was a different style, things politically were beginning to change a lot. And uh, where's Louis Armstrong, the era that he came up in, it was sort of a, uh, black people sort of were a little bit more obsequious in their way they related to other people. Mm. When Charlie Parker came along, it was the end of World War II, and there was more of a thirst in the black community for a little more self-empowerment. Mm. So Charlie Parker represented that more than, say, Louis Armstrong did. You know, But I don't fault Louis Armstrong. I think he was a product of his time. That was sort of what was... Did that make Charlie Parker more influential for you? Or? For me, it, it did. And yes, it, it, in that sense, in the... Uh, Political sense, yeah, it did, because Charlie Parker then sort of expressed what a lot of young people were feeling at that mm-hmm. time, you know. You're being very diplomatic, because I, I, I read that Charlie Parker was your guy. He was the one that you really... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 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 yeah, he was our prophet, and uh, I had a lot of uh, great experiences with Charlie Parker. He really... Uh, was very influential in getting me on the right track when I was a, uh, a, a uh, aspiring musician also. But you didn't want to necessarily emulate any one person. I mean, there's a quote from Coleman Hawkins who once said, you can't play like your idol. Uh, do you think that's true? I think it's impossible to play like your idol, really. But it's also true that you, it can't be done and that it's a bad career choice to try to... <laughs> You know, copy somebody. You know, the copiers never make it. It's the main guy. So if, people, as a kid, if a kid today says, I want to play like Sonny Rollins, what do you say to him? Well, I would say that uh, I can appreciate that Sonny Rollins might have something that he can learn from and he can use some of what I've, I'm, I've done, just like I use some of what Coleman Hawkins did and Charlie Parker and everybody so, uh, yeah, but eventually his own voice will have to be the, uh, you know, will have to come out. Sonny, you were, uh, I mentioned your early success in the introduction. Uh, you were a working musician when you graduated from high school. You f- recorded your first album with Bud Powell at 19. You were playing with Miles at 21. Take me, take me back, to, back to those days. What did it feel like? Did you have a sense that you were playing, you were amongst legends, and, and were you scared? Were you tenacious? Were you freaked out? Were you, how, how were you interacting with these guys as a 19-year-old? Well, you know, it's interesting. I look back on that period. I always had a sense that I was good enough, but there were times when, of course, I realized I was with, you know, really great people, but I was never really afraid, you know, of playing with, all these, all of my idols, you know, maybe I was a little dumb, you know, but uh, I never felt... Uh, you weren't no. intimidated? No, I wasn't intimidated, you know, and uh, I guess that's a good quality. I mean, but you have to be careful. You can't be too overconfident. This is bad also, you know. Was Miles nice to you, nurturing, or was oh, he Miles difficult? Was, yeah, no, Miles was a very beautiful guy. Miles and I had a very good friendship, 
And uh, yeah, first time he heard me, I was playing sort of an opening for him and some guys. So the first time he heard me, oh, he, oh come on, son, he joined my band, you know. So uh, that was in the late uh, 40s, actually. And, um, but he was a very nice, nice uh, friend. Of, we, we were close friends. It was also a scene, Sonny. I mean, it was. A, it seemed you could tell me. I mean, it seemed like it was, it was a lifestyle. There's, there's the music, but there was also drugs. Mm-hmm. Uh, Charlie Parker, of course, struggled with a heroin addiction. Right. So did John Coltrane, and you did as well. Was that a coincidence, or did you believe at the time that drug use would propel you musically in some way? Well, I think uh, a lot of people felt that drug use would propel us musically. Um, over the years, I've thought a lot about this, and uh, I've uh, come to the conclusion that a lot of artists use some kind of drugs. You know, writers uh, drink a lot. And, uh, you know, so trying to, to leave your the common everyday existence is part of being an artist in the sense. An artist wants to sort of go to the next world and create things that have, haven't been done before. So I sort of um, finally got to the point where I, I realized that it's not such a bad thing in a way, but it's a very destructive thing. And so some of the drugs that we were involved in were very destructive. It made you feel good. It made you play maybe a little bit better um, at the moment. But eventually you would reach a, a, a level where you would begin to go down rather than up. What about creativity? I mean, this is sort of heretical to say. You're not supposed to say this uh, these days, uh, you know, that uh, drugs or hard drugs, especially something like heroin, would help fuel creativity. But, I mean, does it? I think it, it, I think it does to a certain degree, yeah. I think it does. I think it does. It makes you feel, you know, wow, good. You, you, you can blot out a lot of the other stupid things that we all have to live with in, in life. I mean, we have to admit that a lot of the things in life are stupid. Hmm. A lot of the television and the commercials and all this stupid stuff that we have to deal with, drugs can center you on what you're doing. So in a sense, it's not such a bad thing. But like everything else, you it can't be overdone. Once it gets to that place, then you, it, you begin to... Uh, hurt yourself. Mm. It's interesting. If I plot this interview, what would the subtext that you, you, you talk about blocking a few things. You've talked about blocking the audience. You've talked about blocking television, blocking distractions, essentially. And I've also heard you say in the past that uh, music I- is not about thinking. When you're actually playing, you don't think or you don't want to be thinking. What do you want to be doing when you're playing? I want to be connecting with the subconscious, if I can call it that, because there's not too many words to describe the real deep inner part of a human being. Uh, So I'll say that's where I want to go. I want to be at that place where everything is blotted out and where creativity happens. I mean, to get there, I practice. You know, I'm a prolific practice. I right. still practice every day. You got to have the rudimentary skills to be able to and, not think. Right? Exactly. Okay. There you go. Yeah. You have to have really have the skills. Then you want to not think when you're playing. That's when you let whatever deep level of creativity, you know, uh, and. Um, uh, uh, spirituality. I mean, these words are so inadequate these days, but you want to get to that place right. where they exist. And then do you know what's happening? Or do you, when that's when it's coming out then, or do you listen back to a recording and go, wow, I was, that's wild. Well, or, I can play when I'm playing in a concert sometimes. I play things that surprise me. I say, wow, where did that come from? How did I think of that? You know. So, um, uh, you know, um, it's something which you 
I wouldn't have wait. I think I'm contradicting myself because I said when I'm playing sometimes and I play something, it surprises me. Mm-hmm. So I do, it brings me back to consciousness for a moment. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, when I realize and I'm thinking. But in general, it's, you want to be away from consciousness. Sounds like you're talking about meditation. Well, I guess meditation, you know, I studied um, uh, yoga in, in uh, India, and, and uh, my guru over there told me, he said, I used to worry about being able to meditate. And uh, you know, in, the, in the normal sense of meditation, so uh, the head of the ashram there was. He said, "Sonny, when you play your horn, you're meditating. Hmm. That is meditation." And that relieved me a lot because I was afraid I couldn't sit down in the lotus position and quiet my mind, and I, you hmm. know, I couldn't do that. It was hard for me to do. Doesn't strike me like that you're a guy who really, uh, despite being appreciative, as you said at the top of, of of the acclaim that you get, who really loves a particularly celebrity lifestyle. You've taken these sal- sabbaticals through your life. You live alone now in the in the home that you lived with uh, with your beloved uh, late wife. Uh, do you feel like you need to get away and be alone to to help fuel what you bring to crowds when you are around people? Well, I find that uh, it's better. If if you're a meditative person, it's better to be able to be in a meditative mood. So uh, I'm a person, even my wife and I, we never like to go to parties and cocktail parties and hang out with people and, you know, a lot of small talk and all this. That, no. I, Not your gig. No, no. I love people, but in the sense of being able to get on a higher level you know like in my playing some people fortunately like my music and they come to me oh Sonny I like your music made me feel like going to work and helped me to get through the day that's good that's how I want to relate to people as far as hanging out at uh you know, Starbucks and something. That, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> you don't want to be hanging out at Starbucks. I got you, Sonny. Throughout your entire career, I mean, you seem like it doesn't surprise me now to have met you and your your, your modest personality. Even in the liner notes of of your latest CD, Roadshows, Volume One. You call yourself your own worst critic, or you've been called your own worst critic. Has that trait been a blessing or a curse in your mind? Well, um. It's something which I can't get around, so I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. You know, I mean, I'm just not. I'm not a person who thinks a lot about praising myself. You know, I mean, I might have been like that when I was starting out a little bit. That that's why I had the courage to go and play with Charlie Park and all these sure, guys. Yeah. But at this stage, um, I know too much. I know what music is, so. I, you know, I sort of eschew praising myself and think about my best aspects. But there's a difference between not praising, between praising yourself and being uh, super critical. I mean, you've said in the past, I hate listening to myself. <laughs> I'm always listening for what I could have done, what I should have done. Is that still true when you listen to some of your early recordings now? Do you still feel that way? Well, I don't listen to my early recordings, so, uh, you know, or my late recordings, unless I have to, you know. Now, sometimes I, I'm someplace and somebody plays. In fact, I was doing a show the other day, and this guy played something, uh, and I heard it, and I said, wow, I forgot what I had done because it's <laughs> been so long ago, you know. But I'm not a person that's sort of... Uh, because I hear what I think I could be doing better, you know. It's amazing the number of musicians who come in here, artists in general, who say that, you know. That wow. they, who have trouble with their, yeah, I mean, the guys in Rush, a big rock band, were here not long ago saying, and we played a bit of their, you know, earlier stuff, big Canadian rock band, and, and uh, Alex Lifeson, the guitarist, was talking about, you know, I just wish my guitar didn't sound that way. I would have changed right. the sound of it. Right, <laughs> you know? good, good. That's good to know that, that that's a real feeling among artists. Well, your your dedication to playing and practicing is legendary. You've got a real discipline when it comes to, to to working at your craft. Are you any closer right now to becoming the musician you've always wanted to be? Well, I think I'm closer. Um, 
I'll never get there. I mean, I realize that. I know that there's no end, you know, in this existence to really getting everything together. So I know that. I mean, I, I've come to that realization a long time ago. But I can get closer to it, and I think I'm getting closer to it now. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, creating music is something which, just like you were saying, when I listened to something I did uh, 40 years ago, there was something else I was doing which might have some merit. So I can't say that now I'm going to incorporate that into everything. No, that's, but it's my hope that I incorporate my whole career into what I'm doing now and that that is, going to, is being a better product in general. So that's sort of where I am now. I feel I'm getting closer, you know, to where I want to go. Now, On the what happens is that there are also physical things. As you get older, you have to worry about, you know. Yeah. You can't uh, do things that you did when you were in your teens. It's just the, the, the way the physical body goes. So that's also working against you being able to do everything you want to do uh, creatively. But when Sonny Rollins says, I'm never going to get there, mm -hmm. I'm closer, but I'm never going to get there, that's a tough one. I, I, you know, I mean, uh, then, then are we, do we end unfinished somehow? I think so. I, I think when we end, the creative person ends, he continues in the next existence. I mean, I'm, I'm a person that feels that this life isn't the end of the be-all and end-all, mm -hmm. I should say, the end-all of everything. You know, I mean, the uh, spiritual person doesn't feel like that. I mean, it's too involved. It's too intelligent. It's too everything to have bang. That's the end of all the struggles, all of the things, the soul you go through. So, uh, yeah, I think you get to that point, and that's the end of that chapter. But whatever you've done is going to propel you in the next chapter, I mean, it's it just it's just so simple to mm. to me, you know. It's you but, know, so uh, yeah. I'm not going to get it all done. I I don't think, you know. I know that, but I'm getting close enough that I'm still propelled to keep uh, keep at it. Well, I'm glad you you're keeping at it. It's a, such a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you for this, Sonny Rollins. Well, thank you for this very uh, deep, <laughs> insightful interview you gave me here today, man. Uh, I appreciate it, man. Uh, yeah. Hope to see you again. Sonny Rollins, a jazz legend and one of the true pioneers of free jazz and the tenor saxophone, join me here live in Studio Q.